Today's first scripture reading is from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land, too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. And now turning to Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 6, verse 9. The very words of Jesus. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. This is the holy word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Last week we started a new sermon series looking at the Lord's Prayer as found in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We learned that Matthew set the context for Jesus sharing this prayer right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon where he is sharing with and teaching people about the foundational principles that he's going to build the rest of his ministry around for three years. We looked at some of the lessons that Jesus taught that day about what not to do when we pray in order to help us get to praying with the right attitude. So if you missed that message, praying with an attitude, you can go back and watch it anytime on YouTube. It's focused on the lessons that are found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Those lessons taught us that the key to praying with the right attitude is to make sure that your prayer is a conversation with God, not something that you do to impress others who might hear it. The portion of the prayer that I want us to turn our attention to this morning is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, the key lessons in verses 5 through 8 all began with the same four words. When you pray, don't. And, and then we learn what we're not supposed to do when we pray. Matthew 6, 9 begins with these three words. Pray like this. It moves us from what we should not do when we pray to what we should do. Really, the topic of the lesson hasn't changed much. Jesus is still talking about the attitude that we should have when we pray. He's told us not to worry about what others may think of our prayer because it's not supposed to be addressed to them anyway. And then he tells us the best way to get our prayer started with the right attitude is to make our prayer all about God. Most of us know the opening phrase of the prayer by heart. We learned it in the old English of the 1600s. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But what does that mean? I think we get the first phrase. We understand that God is our spiritual Father, and we know that even though he dwells among us, he's in heaven. That's that omnipresent attribute of God, his ability to be fully everywhere all the time. Okay, so that's a concept that may be hard for us to wrap our minds around. We don't know anyone else who can be two places at once, let alone everywhere all the time. I, for one, may not understand how he can do that, but I'm okay with that. And I accept it because that's part of what makes God, God. The second phrase is a bit more ambiguous to many of us. Hallowed be thy name. 
I think that the reason this phrase trips more than a few people up in its meaning is partly because of the way we've been taught to say the first word of this phrase. Hallowed. What in the world does hallowed mean? The other part that trips some up is that even when they learn that the word is actually hallowed, it's still an unfamiliar word to them. We don't use the word much, nor do we hear it used very often. In fact, when I think of the word hallowed being used outside of the context of the prayer, the first thing I think of is hearing about the hallowed halls of Congress. Hallowed, that unfamiliar word, it means made holy. It means consecrated. It means greatly revered and honored. So we could reword the phrase of the prayer and put it in a language that we're more used to hearing and maybe even understand better by saying, holy be your name, or consecrated be your name. We could even say, say, greatly revered and honored be your name. The New Living Translation renders this phrase as, may your name be kept holy. Our text for today in Psalm 95 isn't really about prayer. It's about worship, who we should worship and how we should worship. In other words, what our attitude in worship should be, that it should be focused wholly on God. Sounds a lot like prayer, right? I think it's a valuable piece for us to look at regarding prayer as well. The psalmist does a great job of making sure that God is revered and honored in this model for worship that he describes. In fact, I think this could be another model for how to pray as Jesus taught, revering God, honoring God. It's a great example of how to do the second phrase of the Lord's Prayer, not just say it. Verse 1 in our text for today says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Now, if we were to use this psalm as a guide for prayer, we might read it as, Come, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We could go on from there. Let us pray to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. And, and then the psalmist tells us why we should worship, why we should honor, why we should revere, why we should hallow our God. Here's what he says. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest of mountains. The sea belongs to him for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. So the opening of our prayer, if we're using the Lord's Prayer as a model rather than simply a memorized prayer, and we're using Psalm 95 as a guide to the opening of our prayer, it might sound something like, Our Father in heaven, you are Lord. You are the great God. You are the great King above all other gods. You hold in your hands the deepest parts of the earth and the highest and mightiest mountains. The sea is yours, made by you. You form the very dry land we live on as well. You and you alone are worthy of our worship. So let me ask you, what sounds more like honoring and revering God? What I just shared, or our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Which one do you think was what Jesus intended when he said, pray like this? Which of those two displays the attitude that Jesus says we should have when we pray, an attitude that it's about God? The words we say in our prayers should reflect that God is worthy of our honor and our reverence. Just as the words we use in prayer reflect our proclamation that God is worthy, so does our body language. Now, Jesus doesn't address this in the prayer he taught because the people of his time already knew. They had learned to pray in various postures before God. 
The portion of this psalm that we're looking at today uh, ends with these words in verses 6 and 7. Let me remind you again. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. If only you would listen to His voice today. So, the psalmist is saying that we need to bow down before God. Now, I just want to say this bowing down isn't about just bowing our heads. It's about bowing our whole body, our whole being before God as a sign of our reverence to him. So when praying in the manner described in the opening phrases of the Lord's Prayer, bowing might be the most appropriate posture to take. Now I'll be the first one to tell you that the posture of your heart is much more important to God than the posture of your body. But your body language, your body posture is often a reflection of what you're feeling inside. The psalmist also talks about kneeling before God. We tend to think of kneeling before someone as a position of humility. It demonstrates that we are humble in the presence of someone else. But to the ancient Jews, kneeling was the position of blessing. Not not the position one took to receive a blessing. It was the position one took to give a blessing. To the ancient Jew, blessing wasn't about receiving something like money or good health or success. Blessing was about being exalted. The one being blessed was lifted up. They were honored by the one giving the blessing. And when the one giving the blessing knelt before the one they were blessing... It was in order to make less of themselves and more of the one they were lifting up. So kneeling is a great posture for blessing God, for exalting God, for lifting God up for all that God does. A prayer posture we find in the Bible but rarely see used is to be prostrate before God. To prostrate yourself before God, you lay face down on the ground or the floor, arms out to the side or over your head. This is a position of absolute trust and dependence on God. It's the most vulnerable posture we can take. It's the position of ultimate humility and surrender. When we're prostrate before God, we're pretty powerless. This is the posture you might want to assume when your conversation with God is at its most vulnerable. Those moments when you place yourself and your circumstances totally in God's hands. Moses and Aaron both prayed prostrate before God. So did Jesus. Did you know that? Listen to Matthew 26, 39. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, in his most vulnerable moment of his earthly existence, prostrate before God, putting himself completely, wholly in God's hands. Just the opposite of prostrate is standing. It's another important prayer posture. Standing in prayer indicates a willingness to go, uh, a willingness to put your prayer into action, a willingness to respond to God's response to our prayer. Listen to Mark eleven twenty five. And when you stand praying... If you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. In other words, you're standing, you're ready to go do that. Before I go any further, if I have someone that I need to forgive, I need to go do that, and I'm willing to do that. Looking up to heaven is a prayer posture. It's it's like looking God in the eye. And looking someone in the eye indicates confidence and honesty on our part. It's the prayer posture of a relationship of deep trust. 
Jesus often prayed looking up to heaven. When we look up to heaven while praying, it says we know where our hope and our help ultimately come from. Now, these are just a few of the postures for prayer that we find in the Bible. And let me be very clear here. Communication with God, prayer, doesn't require that we take a certain posture. Not even kneeling, hands folded, head bowed, eyes closed. But what postures do is give expression to the attitude of the heart. So what I'm saying is that prayer is supposed to be intentional, thoughtful, meaningful words and actions directed toward God. I don't know about you, but it is so easy for me to fall into my prayer mode where everything just starts to be done by rote rather than being done with intentionality and thought and meaning. That's why I find praying out loud beneficial. Being in different postures and, and thinking about the most appropriate posture to express to God what I'm really feeling helps keep me from falling into that prayer mode. So I want you to think this morning about your typical prayer. How does it stack up so far? Are you learning to pray like Jesus or, or are you continuing to be stuck in routine prayer that has an attitude far from what God desires? Does your prayer state what should be? Hallowed be thy name. Or does it demonstrate what is? You are the Lord. You are the great God. You are the great King above all other gods. And ultimately, I would ask you this question. Which do you think God most longs to hear from you? Let's pray. Holy God, and you are holy. <laughs> you are the Lord, you are the great God, you are the great King above all other gods. You have spoken our world into being. And yet, <laughs> you long to hear from us. You long to be in conversation with us. You want us to share our deepest needs, but you want us to share those because we have ultimate trust in you. You, you want us to look up to the one from whence our hope and help come. You want us to be in intimate relationship and conversation. You want us ready to respond. You want prayer to be so much more than just words, but an expression of our heart. Maybe even more than that, an expression of our whole being that prayer might become the deepest sharing of ourselves that we have with you. You just may desire it to be the deepest sharing of you that you have with us. Teach us to pray, O oh Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I send you out of your worship space this morning uh, to be people who are learning to talk more intimately with God. Because as we learn to talk and communicate more intimately, the relationship becomes more intimate. And as that relationship becomes more intimate, the witness that we have in the world changes dramatically. Go be that kind of witness in every aspect of your living and being and doing in Jesus' name. Amen.